you so much. Thank you, Sarah. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for joining us. My name is Felicia Henry, and I'm the Director of Research and Policy at the Correctional Association of New York. The Correctional Association of New York is the only independent organization in the entire state of New York that has the legislative authority to monitor and oversee conditions in prisons across the state. Today, we are gathered by a couple of people who are super important and special to us. Um, want to give some recognition to the Center for Urban Pedagogy, or CUP, and their public access design program, which is why we're gathered here. And then also want to give special recognition to our guest, Jolene Russ, who is, um, well, she'll introduce herself and tell you all about who she is. And so um, I'm going to hand it over to Augustine and then allow Raina Wellman also to speak as he does the introductions. And then we'll get into a conversation with Mohammed and Jolene. Okay. Thank you, Felicia. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Agustin. I'm a community education program manager at CUP, uh, the Center for Urban Pedagogy. And we're really excited to have collaborated on this project with Canny and also with designer Raina Wellman. Uh, there were also two other collaborators from CUP, Janae Foster and Marissa Hetzler. And uh, unfortunately, they couldn't make it today. Uh, but they were very instrumental in, in this project. Um, together, we created Keep in Touch, which is a guide that explains how to keep in touch with incarcerated people. Um, maybe it would be cute if I shared screen and we, I could just scroll through it while, while I talk a bit about it. Mm -hmm. Uh see. All right, do I have screen sharing? Yes, great. Oh, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. Try. Oh, let me try now. There we go. Okay. Okay, can everybody see? Great. Mm -hmm. Um, so together we created this guide uh, called Keep in Touch. Um, incarceration isolates individuals from their families and communities and staying connected to loved ones in your community is an important aspect of health and well-being, especially for incarcerated people. Family and friends of incarcerated people often struggle to access and understand the rules that explain how to keep in touch with incarcerated loved ones. Um, they often don't know how to navigate the correctional system by themselves or, or where to go for help. And the pandemic has made it even harder to keep in touch with incarcerated loved ones as prison policies regularly change and communication gets disrupted or delayed. And so this visual tool uplifts the key information folks need to know to visit their incarcerated loved ones in person, mail them a letter, send them an electronic message, or talk to them on the phone. It also explains how to uh, file a formal complaint if their or their loved one's rights are violated, and it lists community organizations that can answer questions and connect them with others impacted by incarceration. And so, yeah, over the past Several months we worked with Canny and, and Reina to come up with this um, design. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about CUP and our mission and our programs, and then pass it over to Reina to say a few words about this project. So, CUP's mission is to use the power of art and design to increase meaningful civic engagement in partnership with marginalized communities. There are a lot of different barriers to civic engagement, particularly meaningful engagement, where people get to be a part of decision making around issues that they care about. And so our focus is on the barrier of how hard it is to understand public policy and urban planning issues that shape our daily interactions in the world, as well as what our neighborhoods look like. And so we collaborate with designers and community organizers and advocates 
like Canny, working with communities impacted by social justice issues to make visual explanations of those issues so that more people can understand how they work and how they can be involved in advocating for themselves and to shape their communities. And so to that end, we have several programs at CUP that carry out this mission. And Keep in Touch was part of our public access design program, as Felicia mentioned. So each year we create four pocket-sized guides like this one, and uh, they explain specific issues um, that could benefit from a visual explanation. And so this program is free for the organizations uh, whose topics are selected, and at the end they get a thousand copies. Um, we have a similar program called Making Policy Public, which is uh, similar but just larger in size and it folds out to a poster. We also create for a year and these projects are based on submissions from community organizations who identify the topics. Um, so yeah, we do open calls in March and July for, for both of these programs. Uh, before I pass it to Raina, I'd just like to thank um, Felicia and Raina and also Sarah and Sumit for being great collaborators on this project. And of course, Jolene for your invaluable uh, comments over the course of this project. Uh, let me paste the uh, URL in the chat so that y'all can share with your networks. Um, and I will pass it over to Raina. Yeah, um, well, I'll keep my, my statement about this project pretty brief, but mostly I just wanted to reiterate what a fantastic collaboration this has been. Um, I'm really honored to have had the opportunity to collaborate um, with both Candy and Cup on making this project come to life. And I genuinely hope that this visual tool can really serve um, as a navigational resource. Um, so thank you all for the tremendous amounts of work that I know were put in um, to both this project and helping communi communities overcome uh, difficult barriers consistently. Um, I really believe that creative and collaborative projects like the one that we just completed can make a really meaningful difference. And I am really grateful to have been a part of this one. So again, thank you so much to everyone who has worked on this project. It's been a real pleasure. Um, and thank you to everyone who is going to continue to ensure that this work reaches the communities that it's intended to assist. I know we've just started, so. Yes, I'm so grateful to have been a part. Yes. Yes, thank you both. Um, and Raina, especially, it literally would not exist without you. You designed the entire thing. And so we are grateful uh, for your patience, for um, all of your creativity around this project. And obviously, thank you so much for continuing to lead us. And we're excited about future partnerships, future collaborations. Um, with Cup, with you, Raina, and we're, we're really grateful. So thank you so much. Um, so now we're actually going to move on um, into a time where we're going to be talking about the kind of impact on the ground of communication with incarcerated people and their loved ones. Um, we have Jolene Russ, who I think just dropped off the call, as a matter of fact. Um, but we have Jolene Russ, who is going to talk about um, that experience with Muhammad, and he's going to facilitate that conversation. And so I don't see her here. I think she dropped off a little bit, but until she's back, we can actually move forward um, just so that we're kind of keeping the pace. And so Samit, if you don't mind, I'm going to hand it over to you. Please uh, introduce yourself, and then you can talk a little bit about, um, you know, intake and then uh, set the stage for the rest of the conversation in terms of our findings from our post-visit briefing documents. And if Jolene has a chance to hop back on, then we will um, move back into that conversation. Sure, thank you, Felicia. And no, thanks to everyone. It's really exciting being part of this collaboration and um, you know, being able to put something together uh, for family members of incarcerated people to look at to how to navigate um, right, the, the, the prison system and this um, incredibly, um, you know, what we see through our monitoring as a complex and difficult to navigate, um, you know, system. Um, you know, to uh, Raina's point, uh, just um, 
you know, it is a start. Um, and, you know, one thing uh, that we're currently working on, uh, currently building out, um, is um, expanding um, our communications uh, to communicate uh, directly with more with uh, family members, incarcerated people, and people who, loved ones of people who are incarcerated right now. Um, you know, we have a couple of unique advantages uh, organizationally in that we um, uh, are allowed to um, sort of, uh, we're allowed to have a hotline that any person in prison can call. Um, you don't have to be on an approved list. You know, you could reach out to the Correctional Association. If you're writing to the Correctional Association, it's privileged mail. Uh, same thing uh, if we're writing to folks um, in prisons. We also have unique access uh, where we could go to prisons um, and speak directly with incarcerated people. Um, so, um, you know, what we've been doing, and we actually had uh, our um, uh, one of our interns um, who's been with us the last year from the Columbia School of Social Work, Alex, are working on this, but he's unable to join us today, uh, but putting together not only um, improvements to an action guide uh, that we have, uh, which I will um, share my screen to give folks a brief look right now, um, which allows for um, that we could send to family members and people um, who are incarcerated to uh, self-advocate, uh, but then we're taking it a step farther. And, you know, glad to share this, um, you know, very soon, or glad to share this um, um, to, with, with, with at large. Um, but we're taking an additional step uh, to really um, respond directly to folks make referrals and help provide guidance to navigate, you know, different problems that people come up, people come across um, in the prison system itself. So part of that are referrals to uh, legal representation, different advocate groups working uh, to raise awareness on different issues, uh, elected officials, and then even administrative advocacy directly with the department or directly with the superintendent of the prisons. Um, again, you know, this is a very exciting thing to be a part of because the prison system, especially for family members and loved ones, is incredibly uh, com complicated to navigate. It's not a, um, it's not, a, 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 you know, docs um, doesn't particularly make it easy uh, for family members uh, to communicate um, with uh, people in prison, likewise with visiting. And, you know, any way that we could lend a helping hand uh, through right, uh, the, the, the guy that we created uh, for family engagement, uh, this action guide, or working through uh, using, you know, our hotline, our access to privilege there, and our way to, you know, go into visits and speak to folks in prisons um, is um, our additional ways where we could try to support folks as best we can and try to use our unique access and knowledge um, to give folks some direction on where to go next. So, you know, glad to share all this. Um, there's an additional piece I want to share soon, um, but um, I see Jolene's back with us. So, um, you know, uh, I'll, um, I'll pause and maybe we could continue with the conversation. Thanks, Felicia. Yes. So, Mohammed, I'm gonna hand it over to you, Jolene. I know that you have just a few minutes um, but do want to give you some space to speak about your uh, engagement in the CUP project in particular, and then picking up on some of the things that uh, Samit just talked about, about the difficulty in communication. So, Mohammed, I'll hand it over to you and Jolene. Good evening, everybody, and thank you for allowing me to be a part of this um, event today. Hi, Jolene. Um, I met Jolene hey a few years ago in Albany at an advocacy day. I used to talk to her on the phone. But I met her husband, independent of her, Russ. And Russ was doing fabulous things when I met him in Elmira. And now just meet both of them and to know both of them. It's not only an honor, but it's an insight to what can be done when families stick together and the number one advocates of their loved ones. So Jolene, you know, during the pandemic, you know, communication was hard, to, hard as it is. But during the pandemic, how did you maintain communication with your loved one? During the very onset, um, by the way, hi, I'm Jolene Russ. My partner is Brian Russ. He's been inside 22 years. He's currently at Sing Sing. Um, we've been doing this for a long time. Yes. So when the, when the pandemic first hit early onset, thankfully he was in a porter position and he was able to make phone calls to me regularly from the field house when he was working there 
Um, and also he was still the ILC chairman and he was asked to um, elongate his mm. uh, term in that because normally it's a one year term. So they asked them to, to give him a, some more time because they were doing so well. Um, that's actually where you had met him, Mr. Muhammad. Mm -hmm. And so we were able to maintain really good communication through that rec quarter position um, only until about um, July or September when our advocacy got too strong and it posed a problem uh, po posed a problem for Brian's safety because while well I'll leave it just at that um, because the the, re the the reason why a lot of people do not advocate is because the the fear of retaliation is very real and present at all times when you're dealing with docs. Um, I think in every complaint that I've ever written, my husband and I both always make sure that we include that we ask that no retaliation or um, anything of that manner come against us because of us the filing of said grievance. Um, so during the pandemic, for those early months, it was really important for us to be able to get that information into Elmira because this was a, a novel disease. Nobody knew anything about it. Mm -hmm. um, and being that he was the ILC chairman, he just and getting them so much material um, from the right CDC information, like all the printouts, so he could bring them to these meetings and have real discussions with the administration. And it really showed for a short, very short window of time, how well an ILC and an administration could work together. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, the, the powers that be and, and the nature of the beast got shut that down pretty quickly. Okay. Tell me this, what does staying connected mean to you and your husband? Oh, the first word that comes to mind is consistency, because while it's sometimes very difficult to stay connected, the importance of the consistency is invaluable to the person that's in prison. Um, just for them to constantly have an outlet and a, and a pair of legs to get the things done that they really need done, as long as they're you know within reason and considerable constructive things like for a person to have an advocate on the outside, whether that be a partner, whether it be a parent, regardless, just to have an out, a consistent outlet out here, a person to stay connected to consistently, um, super important for any person in prison. And last, Anyone in detainment, period. Okay, lastly, um, what was it like to participate in this process of creating the Keep in Touch pamphlet, really? I really have to say, Mr. Muhammad, it was an honor because it was handled so considerately. Um, they made sure that we all felt very included and our words were valuable. I, um, I'm, I've been trying to put it into my advocacy work a little bit more that um, I have a learning disability. I have um, ADHD and I, I it's hard for me to read sometimes. So those things can't come into play when it comes to my speeches and things I do publicly, but it also comes into play with things like this. Mm -hmm. And when I said that at the first meeting and I wasn't kind of like eye roll that or anything, it, it really made me feel like I was included and the input that I had was important. Um, and and it really, it just meant a lot um, to be a part of it and then to have uh, Brian's input as well, um, and things that he's showed me through grievance writing over the years, um, to be able to have that incorporated as well was, it meant a lot. And I really do appreciate it so much. Thank you, Jolene. You, you know, I'm a supporter of you and Brian. And I, I know thank you. you. Are. And I We're thank asking, you. We really do. I love seeing you pop up in, in advocacy work. It just really, it helps us feel supported. Thank you. Okay, Felicia. Thank you so thank much, you. Mohammed. Jolene, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate, we appreciate it. And you. We hope to stay connected. Take care. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.
So I am going to thank you so much, Mohammed, for facilitating that conversation and just a great reminder of how important our work is, how important it is for families to stay connected, how, it is, how important it is to even develop what we've developed, that Keep in Touch pamphlet that really outlines why it's so important, outlines how to stay connected. And we'll talk a little bit more about how that guide overlaps with our work. And so I'm gonna hand it back to Submit now to talk a little bit about our monitoring work and kind of pulling in some of those findings from what we're doing a little bit more broadly. So Submit, I'm handing it back to you. Thanks, Felicia, again. Um, and um, I think that was so great. Um, you know, Jolene, um, just hearing you speak, just the way sort of this works out um, as far as the agenda, um, I think this will flow right into it. Because one thing, Jolene, you said that communication is really important because um, it allows for advocates uh, like, you know, family members to advocate on behalf of incarcerated people. Um, and, you know, one thing um, as far as what we're Sort of tasks to do um, is um, you know go to prisons, uh, create uh, sort of prison-based monitoring reports uh, to issue to the public. Um, you know the this came about um, sort of a lack uh, you know from a problem that we had historically um, in accessing prisons, and um, sort of what happened um, as a result of those issues uh, towards access um, is in two thousand and twenty one. Uh, there was legislation passed that codified the Correctional Association's right uh, to visit state prisons and monitor state prisons. Uh, so part of that, we're required to visit each of the state prisons every five years, uh, issue a report uh, to the Department of Corrections and Community Supervision on the conditions behind that prison um, and uh, by which they respond. Um, and, um, and then we look to use, you know, our outline other areas of correspondence and what we're hearing in the field uh, to also look to, um, you know, inform um, our view of these different prisons. So today is actually when, uh, you know, we're releasing, uh, tomorrow morning is when we're releasing the first four um, of our prison-based reports, but I definitely want to share a preview, um, you know, today. So I'll share my screen right now. Um, and. Um, you know, well, um, very briefly, um, you know, run through, um, you know, the reports from um, our first, um, you know, four uh, prison visits. So I think um, y'all should be able to see the monitoring visit to Great Meadow Correctional Facility or prison um, right now. Uh, so, um, you know, as you could see, in order to go to these prisons, we're spending multiple days there, um, you know, conducting a good amount of interviews with incarcerated people. Um, you know, in different programs, um, and then taking uh, time to collect data to better understand the issues that are affecting people um, who are incarcerated, and to, again, borrow from Jolene, um, you know, work to advocate to change these conditions. I mean, you know, folks who don't have an individual advocate on the outside essentially don't um, have an opportunity to share what's happening to them. And prisons while they're incarcerated. And, you know, our unique access, uh, the fact that we're, uh, you know, physically allowed to enter prisons and speak to people confidentially and be able to take that in, um, really gives us a unique way to maybe play a role in the larger uh, advocate, uh, in a, a larger role as an advocate for, you know, people in prisons at large. I mean, you know, just going to Great Meadow again, I know we have limited time, so I'm just going to rush through some of this, but very encouraging folks to read, um, you know, each of our reports, um, you know, a third of incarcerated people at Great Meadow did not feel safe from being injured, bullied, or threatened in prison, and almost 80% of respondents experienced harm, um, harm from the disciplinary system. Um, you know, we have, um, it's, um, it's uh, particularly troubling uh, to hear um, that some of the things that we hear about in individual cases or one-offs um, are essentially systemat systemic across, um, you know, in certain prisons uh, and, uh, you know, at large. Um, you know, I think right here uh, we have, um, you know, a set of baseline recommendations, uh, but, um, you know, really appreciate uh, that this isn't an exhaustive list and that there's a lot of work that needs to be done. But we are hopeful that by sharing some of what are in these reports, uh, some of these recommendations, uh, some of the data uh, that we gather, which is actually right here in the end, uh, that shows that you know, a significant amount of folks are bringing up 
these concerns and observing the same things um, across entire prisons that it will lead uh, to folks um, right paying attention and uh, right perhaps advocacy being done uh, for an improvement of conditions for incarcerated people and for the people who care for them who are affected by this um, will happen. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing just to switch over um, to a few of our other, um, to, to the remaining uh, reports. I believe this should be um, Clinton uh, that is pulled up right now. Sorry, I am a bunch of screens open. Um, so we went to Clinton in July, from July 21st to 22nd, 2021. Um, you know, our largest, uh, you know, major observation over here is that it was an antiquated facility, um, you know, and based on that was, uh, you know, failing to provide adequate services around medical, dental, mental health, uh, large staff shortages. Um, there were three deaths in the prison over the course of 30 days um, in June and July 2021, which is right before we conducted uh, the monitoring visit. Um, and, um, you know, it seems, uh, again, systemic problems are rising as far as 80% of respondents not considering the grievance or disciplinary process fair, um, and, um, you know, significant problems uh, with staffing shortages, specifically around medical um, and dental. Um, you know, we have vacancies here, uh, five out of the 53 medical positions, uh, but, you know, remembering that one of those vacancies was they did not have a dentist at the prison, and that being a significant concern. Um, you know, just uh, each of these reports really drills down on um, the many things that, you know, family members need to address themselves uh, with docs or with advocates or with legal representation to simply get sort of basic needs met. Um, and, um, you know, moving on, um, I just want to leave some time um, and stay on our timeline. Um, you know, we went to downstate. Oh, uh, this is, um, we went to downstate, um, and hold on, let me get the downstate one. In October 22nd, uh, this prison is now closed um, as part of, um, you know, the closures uh, that were announced last year. Um, you know, one thing that we noticed at downstate, which was different from Clinton um, and Great Meadow, uh, was that since downstate was operating as a reception, uh, there is a working cadre there and people who are forced uh, to be part of that cadre removed from the reception process generally, you know, placed in a situation where they have to work um, and do not have a choice of uh, denying, um, you know, that work assignment or are penalized by uh, being transferred farther away from their families. Um, another um, you know, uh, issue. I mean, the first recommendation is around communication. I won't get into that uh, right now. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, there's just uh, one more. Um, I'll just want to quickly show y'all because um, it is unique as well. Um, you know, we went to visit uh, to Bedford Hills um, over here um, and um, uh, on November 22nd, which was around the time that uh, New York City entered into an agreement with the state. Uh, to transfer people who were incarcerated at the RMSC on Rikers um, to, um, you know, be held for trial at Bedford Hills. Um, you know, when we went to that prison, uh, you know, what we uncovered was that uh, those folks were transferred to a prison that was already struggling uh, to provide services to the people who were there. Uh, there were problems with, uh, you know, um, around healthcare, uh, similar to the other places, uh, but particularly at Bedford Hills, uh, was a significant uh, staff shortage around uh, program staff, um, also medical, dental, and mental health. Um, I think the program staff is here. I'm not uh, I'm looking for it, but, um, um, but um, you know, our visit uncovered that there was a further a deterioration in the administration of services for incarcerated people who were already at Bedford Hills, as well as folks who were transferred. Um, and, um, you know, had to look at sort of a recommendation around staff levels, um, you know, um, um, at that present. Um, either way, I don't want to, you know, go on for too long, uh, but just want to encourage folks to take a look at this uh, when we, um, uh, when they are released. Um, and, um, and also, um, you know, as far as uh, you know, using it for advocacy and just tying it back to why it's important to communicate with people in prisons and share these stories. 
is really, I think, the key theme uh, that we're working around here at Canning, but also through this collaboration. Um, so, you know, really excited for um, us to grow on being able to, um, you know, do more around intake, do more around corresponding with people, giving people the resources they need to navigate the system and create some sort of change. Um, so, um, uh, thank you, Felicia, and thanks to everyone for, for just, you know, being part of this and allowing me to be a part of it. Thank you so much, Sumit, uh, for taking us through all four of those. And as he mentioned, uh, we will be releasing those tomorrow. And so folks will have an, a chance to go on our website and download each of those PDFs and really do encourage folks to take advantage of that. Um, our plan is to continue to uh, develop and publish post-visit briefing documents as we continue to go on our monitoring visits, um, as we have done so far this year and continue to, to plan for the rest of the year. Um, I just want to lift up a couple of things from some of the documents that Summit talked about that were really specifically around communication. And so we made several uh, recommendations, both facility specific and then system wide recommendations around re uh, communication. Um, I'm making that distinction because we found that at each facility or each prison, there were different processes in place, different relationships with administration, and just different access in terms of communication and communication abilities. And so what we do when we make these recommendations is split them into facility-specific recommendations. And then as these issues or themes start to come up across prisons or across facilities, then we start to develop what we consider to be system-wide recommendations, which are recommendations that as it sounds, we believe should be implemented across the entire prison system. And so as it relates to communication, as it relates to the importance of family members and loved ones to be able to communicate with their incarcerated loved ones, uh, we made a couple of recommendations around improving communication. So uh, both by video and by phone. So increasing the available times and the means of communications. And so what that means is that Currently, we had, uh, you know, when we made our visits and had interviews with incarcerated people, they talked to us about the ability for folks who were in the SHU um, or these kind of segregated units to be able to make phone calls through their tablets, right? So these tablets that are accessible to generally the entire population, give or take. Um, and they had the ability to make phone calls through their tablets as they were in these segregated units. However, for general population individuals, so folks were, that were not in these units, um, while they had the tablets, they did not have access to make phone calls on those tablets. And so thinking about this kind of distinction between general population and the shoe and how that uh, basically created some tension across the population where there were some people who were able to do it and some people who were not able to do it. And so one of our recommendations was really allowing those phone calls, telephone calls through those tablets and then continuing to increase the means of communication, which means not only allowing folks to make uh, calls through their tablets, but then also repairing phones. So broken phones that or malfunctioning phones across those facilities, and then also increasing the numbers the number of phones that were available. Um, as you'll find in even our future reporting, um, as we go to the facilities, we recognize that between the malfunctioning phones and then where the phones are located, we have dozens and dozens of people who are trying to access the same phone. And so that means that even the basic things that, uh, or the basic time they should be allowed is not actually followed through on. So increasing the means of communication, increasing the times at Bedford Hills in particular, there was um, a change in the time that they were able to make phone calls. So a very simple, meaning, seemingly simple change from 7.30 to 8, 8 o'clock a.m. And that actually precluded a lot of the women there from being able to talk to their to children and their family before they actually had to head off to school, for example. So you kind of see how some simple changes make the world of difference when it comes to being able to stay in communication with loved ones and family members. And then the rest of the recommendations really kind of 
revolve around the access to communication in terms of those telephone calls, video um, uh, access, right? A lot of, as Samit mentioned, a lot of the uh, folks who were transferred from Rikers Island, they had a particular access to, to video communication with both their attorneys and also their families that was not necessarily available at Bedford Hills because of technology limitations. And so thinking about how to open up the access to communication, open up the means of communication, open up the availability of communication in terms of time. Those are all recommendations that you'll see in all four of those documents that we put out there. And you'll also see um, as Summit kind of went down to the bottom or the end of the document, you'll see uh, real life um, examples of what that communication or lack thereof can do for folks who are on the inside. So for example, you know, one person told us they have had no visits for a really long time and they have a fear of losing their loved ones, especially in the, in the time of the pandemic. And so thinking about ways that that communication or lack thereof actually causes a strain on the folks that are incarcerated or even thinking about um, when visitations were in place and folks uh, had a restriction on being able to touch their family members, thinking about ways that that also produced strain or, you know, all of those kinds of things. And so I think, again, we hope that you will take the time to read through those um, documents and really see not only uh, communication related uh, issues and our recommendations, which is the point of this entire program, but also just the larger context in which we are operating, the larger context in which incarcerated people are in and the conditions of their confinement and how those things actually also cause that strain and how we already know that the ability to communicate with their family members alleviates some of that stress and that worry as they are inside. So again, I will say, please make sure that you uh, read those documents um, and, and get an understanding of what's going on in the inside. So, you know, as we wrap up and kind of come to the end of uh, today's program, just want to echo again that Candy's work is not just, you know, making sure that uh, loved ones get connected or stay connected to their loved ones inside, but also furthermore that we just really understand and highlight what it is that's happening on the inside. That's really what Candy does, right? We're being able to monitor and oversee these conditions and these prisons to really be able to shine a light, so to speak, on what's going on the inside and then provide these recommendations that we think are really practical, really tangible ways of improving the conditions inside. So we're really glad and really uh, grateful to be able to have participated in this project in the Keep in Touch guide or pamphlet because, you know, as it, as we've done this work and as Samit kind of talked about and he didn't get a chance to really fully delve into it, but the action guide that he talked about earlier is really an opportunity for us to provide resources and referrals and all of these kind of things for folks who are on the inside. But now the Keep in Touch guide allows us to add that um, to our long list of resources to give to incarcerated people and their family members. And so again, we're really grateful for the opportunity to have participated in the program and to be able to produce such a tangible and valuable resource. And so that concludes the uh, program today um, or the event today. And we're really excited and happy and grateful that you all have attended. Um, if there are any questions, feel free to ask us um, feel free to kind of get into the weeds about some of these post-visit briefing documents or about where you might be able to get the guide or have access to these printed copies. We have thousands, so don't worry, and we're happy to distribute them. But um, on behalf of Candy, thank you so much for attending and have a great rest of your day.